church? When I walk up to that tune, I feel like I should dance up to here, but it would be ugly. <laughs> uh, let's stand together and open our Bibles to Numbers chapter 13. We started a series a couple weeks ago called, I've Got Your Number. And uh, the, it's just a little play on the word there, number, because all of our ser- sermons out of the book of Numbers. And the title of the message this morning is Becoming a Giant Slayer. And every one of us in life face giants at one time or another. Some of them almost seem to be insurmountable at times. And sometimes because they are so big, we start looking at the giant and take our eyes off God, don't we? And God wants us to learn to keep our eyes on him all the time. So in Numbers chapter 13, verse 1, the Lord now said to Moses, Send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I am giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of the twelve ancestral tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that we will be like Moses and do as you have commanded us to do. And Father, I pray that as we study your word this morning, our hearts will be strangely warmed and encouraged. Lord, I have no doubt whatsoever that there are many, many in this room right now and many that are watching on live stream right now that have giants in their life. And God, I pray this morning you will teach them through your word and through the unction of the Holy Spirit that nothing is too great for you to conquer. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Israel at this particular juncture in time had been traveling for about two more months. They're not that far from Mount Sinai. And can you imagine they're now on that threshold of blessing? That land the Lord had promised them, the land of milk and honey, I mean, it was just right there. They can taste it, and they're about to go in, and they're excited about it, but then all of a sudden they learn something about that land they weren't counting on, and it's this, there were giants in that land. Now, we've studied this before, and we have known and noticed that as they have traveled through the, the desert, there were many blessings that God gave them. An abundance of blessings, if you will. God guided them every step of the way. But also, laced within those blessings, there were many giants. So they had many things they had to overcome along the way. And now they finally get on the brink of going into the promised land, that land of milk and honey. And then they decide they can't trust God anymore. Isn't that just like us? I mean, how many of you would say that God has blessed me throughout the course of my life? Would you raise your hand up real high and wave it back and forth saying, thank you, Lord? He has. He has blessed us. And isn't it amazing that sometimes we forget the miracles that God has provided in our life along the way, and we forget that he's always had victory in the past, and he's going to have victory over whatever giant you are facing right now. So how do we deal with giants? Let me say this. However you choose to deal with a giant will determine the outcome of your life. Did you hear that? However you choose to deal with a giant will determine the outcome of your life. And you can deal with a giant one of two ways. You can deal with a giant your way or you can deal with a giant God's way. Church, which way do you think might be better? It's always God's way. So if you're taking notes, write this down. A gigantic blessing from God. God wants to bless us. And sometimes we forget how much he wants to bless us. The Bible tells us he wants to open up the heavens and through the windows of heaven pour blessing after blessing upon us. But look at this as they are looking at God's promised land. The Lord now said to Moses, send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I'm giving you, or giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of the 12 ancestral tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He sent out 12 men, all tribal leaders of Israel, from their camp in the wilderness of Paran. These are the names of the men Moses sent out to explore the land. Moses called Hosea, son of Nun, by the name Joshua. Moses gave the the men the instructions as he sent them out to explore the land. Go north through the Negev into the hill country. Now the hill country is somewhere near Austin. You'll understand that better here in a little while. See what the land is like and find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Do their towns have walls 
or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile, poor? Are there many trees? Do your, uh, do your best to bring back samples of the crops you see. It happened to be the season for harvesting the first ripe grapes. So here they are. God's describing this land of milk and honey. And God already knew what it looked like, didn't he? Because God is God. And how much does God know? He knows everything. So he wanted them to see what the land of milk and honey was like. So he's asking all these questions so that as they go in there, they can answer these questions in their own hearts. And they'll know that what God had been telling them is absolutely true, that there would be plenty for everyone. There would be cities there, beautiful cities, that would be their own. They could go in and take these cities as their own. There would be crops that would bear fruit that would be unlike any fruit they had ever seen in all of their lives. And God said, here's all I want you to do. I just want you to trust me and go in and take possession of the land. Now, it's interesting because this promise of this land of milk and honey was their inspiration. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, it was the reason they left Egypt, right? That God had promised them this beautiful land, this promised land. And so because of that promise, they left Egypt. It's the reason that they went out in the desert and wandered around for many, many years and decades. They're out in the desert in an unpleasant area and place. It's the reason that they left the security that they had known all of their lives, which was Egypt. And what were they in Egypt, church? Slaves. But they left all of that, and now they're going to enter into the unknown all because of one promise from God, I will give you a land of milk and honey. And all of a sudden, this dream that they had is coming true. I mean, they're right there on the precipice. Have you ever wanted something really, really bad in your life? And all of a sudden, you, you find yourself, it seems like it takes forever to get there. For, for you children, it's like Christmas, right? I mean, it takes forever to get there, and then you have Christmas Eve, and you know it's the next day, and, and you're so excited about what is going to happen. Maybe it's something else for you, but you understand what I mean. Maybe, maybe for a, a, a mother, uh, that day that she's going to give birth, and she looks forward with a great anticipation for that day, and then that day finally comes, and she's screaming and yelling and thinking, what in the world did I do this for, you know? But it's right there. That's where they are. They're, they're about to walk into that promised land. It's just there on the horizon. And look at this promise that was kept by God in verse, 13, or verse 23. When they came to the valley of Eshcol, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes so large that it took two of them to carry it on a pole between them. They also brought back samples of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the Valley of Eshcol, which means cluster, because the cluster of grapes the Israelite men because of the cluster of grapes the Israelite men cut there. After exploring the land for forty days, the men returned. Now again, God wanted the people to see everything I promised you is one hundred percent true, but I want you to see it for yourselves. So here's what God said: I want you to send out twelve spies into this land of milk and honey, and they went there. And it was better than anything they had dreamed. It was better than anything they had imagined. And they went for 40 days. They studied that land of milk and honey. They looked at the people. They looked at the towns. They looked at the cities. They looked at the homes. They looked at the crops. They studied everything. And they just could not believe what they were seeing. And they thought, you know, we could come in here and take this land. This is at least what God wanted them to think. We could go in here and take this land. We've already got houses for our family. All we got to do is just pick out the house we want. There are these huge crops, so we're never going to be hungry if we go in there. There's more than enough. And the Bible says that they brought back a cluster of grapes. One cluster of grapes. Get this. We read this like this is no big deal. It was so large, they had to put it on a pole, and it took two men to carry it. This is evidence that the seeds came from Texas, those grape seeds. <laughs> they went to the hill country, got the seeds, and planted those things. So they come back to share this exciting report, and they're, they're anticipating how the rest of the people are going to respond. But there was just one little problem. There's the land with one big problem. Now, there's two attitudes that we see here. 
The first attitude is the no, we can't report. No, we can't. And I want you to see in verse 30. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored would devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. They were giants. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. Now, everything God said, was it true or was it false? It was all true. Everything was true, but there were giants in the land. So 10 out of the 12 spies said, we can't go in there. I mean, we saw all the stuff that God had promised, and sure enough, it is all there just like God said, but there's giants over there. They showed a tremendous lack of faith to the same God who had been with them all the way through the desert, who had guided them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, had shown them miracle after miracle after miracle. He took care of them. He provided for them. And now they're showing a lack of faith. They lost all hope. We can't do it. We traveled all this way for nothing. Any of you ever see uh, Vacation? Where they traveled all the way to Wally World? And it was closed. And they couldn't believe that it was closed. It was uh, undergoing renovations. Can you imagine finally getting to the promised land? And they're saying, folks, it's closed. It might as well be. Because there are giants over there, and we're like little bitty grasshoppers. You know what their problem was? They took their eyes off of God. That was their problem. You like Charlie Brown? Yeah. Charlie Brown, uh, in one of the cartoons, Snoopy was on his doghouse, and he's writing a novel, you know. And the novel began this way. It was a dark and stormy night. And he dreams of becoming a novelist and, and becoming a, a, a writer and sending that in to some publisher. He dreams of all that, and so he did. He wrote the novel, he sent it in, and in a little while, a few weeks later, he gets a, a letter back from the publishing company, and they said in the letter, please find two rejection slips, one for the story you sent us and the other for any future stories you send us. It's easy to get discouraged sometimes. I mean, I've, I've been discouraged. How many of you have ever been discouraged? Would you raise your hand? I mean, there are times in life that we feel defeated and we feel discouraged and we don't know what to do and we're kind of scratching our heads asking God for guidance and, and we just don't know what to do. Now, here's their mistake. Their conclusion is found in verse 31. They said, we cannot attack these people because they are stronger than us. But they forgot who's stronger than the people. God amen so where were their eyes their eyes were not on God their eyes were on themselves and that is the crime I guess that we commit when we show a lack of faith we take our eyes off God and we put them on ourselves and we begin to say we can't we can't we can't now there's another attitude we see first was the we can't do it report and here's the second attitude we see we can do it report it's found in verse 30 but Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses let's go at once you think he might have been excited let's go right now let's don't waste any time let's go at once he said we can certainly conquer it so Caleb and Joshua saw things a lot differently than the other ten spies that went into the land. And so Caleb and Joshua are trying to quiet down and stop the negative talk that was going on. And they said, folks, don't listen to these guys. God said it's ours and we can do it with God. Now here's the point. We should always trust God no matter what the circumstances and no matter what it may look like and how big it is. Folks, we can always trust the Lord. Amen? Here's something else we see. We have to remain calm. Everybody say, remain calm. Look at the person next to you. Scratch their back and say, remain calm. I shouldn't have done that. Now some of you are going to go to sleep. 
here's their problem. They put fear ahead of God. They were putting fear ahead of God, their personal fear ahead of the Lord. Look at chapter 14, verse 1. Then the whole community began weeping aloud, and they cried all night long. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt, or even here in the wilderness. It's important that you remember where they wanted to die, either in Egypt or here in the wilderness, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us into this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Then they plotted among themselves, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. Now, think about this. The report of ten spies caused three million people to be paralyzed by fear. Do you think words are important? Do your words matter? You see, we have to be cautious and careful because not only are other people listening to what we say, but God Almighty is listening to what we say, right? And 10 people put fear into the hearts of 3 million people. So how do people respond? The Bible says they wept all night long. Can you imagine that hearing Three million people outside your tent as Moses was listening to them crying and wailing and they were complaining about the leadership. And they said, this is all the fault of Moses and this is all the fault of Aaron. And they promised us a land of milk and honey, but they didn't tell us about the giants. They didn't tell us about those guys. What in the world is wrong with them? But they forgot, again, they forgot about the provision of God in the past and and the power that God had demonstrated to them in the past as they journeyed and the miracles, miracle after miracle that God had shown them. I'm in control. I'm in charge. You can trust me. But they forgot all about that. And so here's what they do. They said, you know what we need to do? We need to get us some new leaders so we can go back to Egypt. And again, church, what were they in Egypt? Wow, how quickly they forgot how miserable their lives were when they were back in Egypt as slaves. You know something? Those that ignore God will always ignore God's leaders as well. Always pay attention to the leadership of God. Amen? Well, let's make it very clear. Verse 5, chapter 14. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down on the ground before the whole community of Israel. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, tore their clothing. They said to all the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It is, a, it is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord. And don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless. Pray to us. They have no protection. But the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. Now why did they suddenly fall to the ground? Perhaps it was because they expected the judgment of God to fall. You see, they had seen fire from heaven before, haven't they? And that fire from heaven would fall down. It would consume whatever was in the pathway. And maybe they fell down because they they probably thought God's fire is about to come upon all of us and exterminate all of us. Or maybe they fell down before the Lord to delay his judgment. Maybe that's what it was. Now, it's interesting that Moses and Aaron show tremendous love for the people right here. And you know what they're doing? They're putting themselves between God and God's people. That's often referred to as the thin place. It's called intercession. They said, God, we're going to stand here in this thin place between you and your people, and we're asking you, God, to spare them. That's what we want you to do. We fear for their lives. Now, you know what's something that God doesn't put up with? Rebellion. Is there anywhere in the Bible that you've ever seen that people rebelled against God and God said, ah, that's okay? Never. He will not put up with rebellion. Now, God is good, and because God is good, he always keeps his promises. But on this day, fear and panic won the day. Now, here's the last thing. 
What does it cost to rebel against God? There is a serious price when you rebel against God. Now, first of all, we notice this. A shepherd loves his sheep. You believe that? You believe God loves you? Three of you believe God loves you? Do you believe God loves you? He's the great shepherd. And those whom God calls to serve him, such as myself, a pastor, you may call me, there are many names for a pastor in the Bible. There's a, there's a pastor, there is teacher, there's pastor, teacher, uh, there's elder, there's bishop. And my favorite of all is found in the book of Revelation where they call their pastors angels. So you can call me Angel Mark if you want to. <laughs> but a good pastor loves his people. And that's exactly what we see right here with Moses. Look at chapter 14, verse 10. But the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. For what? Because they gave a good report. And so let's just stone them because we don't want to hear this. Even though it's true, we don't want to hear it. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me even after all the miraculous signs I have done among them? I will disown them and destroy them with the plague. Then I will make you into a greater and mightier nation than they are. But Moses objected. What will the Egyptians think when they hear about it? He asked the Lord. They know full well the power you displayed in rescuing your people from Egypt. Please, Lord, prove that your power is as great as you have claimed. For you said... The Lord is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love, forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion. Aren't you thankful God forgives sin and rebellion? And aren't you glad there's no limit on the kind of sin and rebellion he will forgive? Amen. Praise his name. But he does not excuse the guilty. He lays the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. In keeping with your magnificent, unfailing love, please pardon the sins of this people just as you have forgiven them ever since they left Egypt. Then the Lord said, I will pardon them as you have requested. Now, God is now, here's the Greek word, or the Hebrew word, I said it's a word in the Old Testament. Here's the Hebrew word for it. God is now ticked off. He is angry. He says, how long am I going to have to put up with these people? I've shown them miracle after miracle, and still they do not believe me. And so here's what God initially does. He says, Moses, stand clear. Now, if, if, you, if you heard God say to you, you better stand clear, do you think you might move? So he says, stand clear because I'm going to destroy these faithless people. And Moses, I'm going to make a brand new nation from you as I have promised. But get out of the way. An interesting thing happens. Earlier, Moses would have said, yeah, God, go ahead, zap them all. He was was not happy with them himself, right? So earlier he would have said, "Yeah, yeah, can I have a part in this? But now he's saying, no, God, please don't kill your I'm begging you to spare them. Now, Moses reasons with God. He says, God, if you destroy them, think about this. What will the Egyptians think? God, if you destroy them, what will the nations think? And the Bible says that God heard the prayer of Moses. And in verse 20, he says, I will pardon them for their unfaithfulness. But still, there were consequences. Now, here's the thing. God will forgive you of your sins. But even though he will forgive you of your sins, are there consequences for sins? There are. Sin is always punished. You can't hide it from God. No matter how hard you try, you cannot hide your sin from God. And sin always leaves scars. Now, that doesn't mean that God is through with you or he's he's not going to use your life anymore. God wants to use your life, even the scars in your life. And we've all got scars in our life, don't we? Every one of us do. Now, look at the pain of the price. Verse 26. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long must I put up with this wicked community and its complaints about me? Yes, I have heard the complaints the Israelites are making against me. Now tell them this, As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I heard you say. You will all drop dead in the wilderness. Isn't that what they said they wanted? They said, Let us die in Egypt or let us die here in the wilderness. And God says, All right. 
Don't you know that they were wishing they hadn't prayed that or said that? Verse 29, you will all drip, drop dead in the wilderness because you complained against me. Every one of you who is 20 years old or older and was included in the registration will die. You will not enter, the, enter and occupy the land I swore to give you. The only exceptions will be Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. Remember when the Israelites said they wanted to die in the desert? You know, have you ever been thankful that God didn't give you something you asked him for? <laughs> yeah, we need to learn this. So he says everyone older than 20 is never going to enter the promised land. Never. Here's the point I, I grab from this. If one gen generation, if one generation loses the faith, God will move on to the next one. Do you see it? If the older generation loses the faith, God says, I'll go with the younger generation. Because of the sin of the parents, the ch children wandered for 40 more years, all except Joshua and Aaron. You see, God wants us to be faithful. Even in hard times, even in difficulties, even during those times that we cannot begin to see how God is going to get the victory, we still have to trust him. Amen.